was a tiny bit of background. Um, I got my PhD at the University of Michigan, uh, and I was hired at Rice in the fall of 1979, which means I have had, as students, the children of people that I had as students. Uh, um, my, uh, most of my research and my teaching is on international conflict, American national security policy, things like that. Um, and um, I will be actually retiring at the end of this semester from us. Uh, so uh, uh, that's how that goes. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, as in most universities, you do a lot of things other than teaching and doing research. I guess the, the, uh, the thing I'm most known for at Rice is that I wrote the memo that proposed the idea of the James Baker Institute. Uh, and for whatever reason, the president of Rice actually read the memo. Uh, and uh, we do have the Baker Institute that celebrated its 30th year. So for those of you, just be careful when you write memos because people may actually read them, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, so that's the happy stuff. Now on to the depressing things about international conflict. And um, um, when I was thinking about exactly, well, which thing should I cover? Um, I turned uh, my attention to something called the Annual Threat Assessment, which is done by something called the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. For those of you who don't know all the boring details, the US government actually has 18 intelligence agencies uh, that do various things. And uh, not that long ago, it was decided we probably need one per an office over all of them. And that's the Office of Natural, National Intelligence. So I, um, um, uh, in terms of the places uh, and situations that uh, they thought were things the US government should worry about, uh, that's uh, kind of how I got most of my stuff. Um, I am going to start by talking about uh, the, uh, the Israeli-Hamas war, okay? And uh, I have a few slides here, let's see, okay? Um, and uh, I realize I bet you're probably familiar with this strategy by now. Um, and um, there have long been issues with Hamas and Israel. They have not, how shall I put this, gotten along very well ever. Uh, the current situation started in October of 2023, uh, and that was on October 7th, uh, when Hamas killed about 1,200 Israelis and took about 250 Israelis hostage. Um, now, these are figures given by the Israelis, and so some people may say, well, those aren't quite exactly right, but there's no question it was a horrendous act. Um, now, since that time, of course, Israel has gone after Hamas, uh, and um, uh, it was best to- Can, can everybody hear okay, the microphone? It's a little quiet. Oh, a little bit, okay, it's okay? No. Oh, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Close it. Okay. Okay. Uh, and um, since the start of the, uh, the campaign, um, uh, the best estimates are that about 33,000 uh, Gazans have been killed and another 75,000 have been injured. And if you do the math, that is about 18% of the total population of Gaza. So tremendous losses. Um, uh, and uh, you probably saw recently that the Israelis uh, attacked mistakenly uh, a rural central kitchen, and, which is an aid group, and, and killed uh, a number of their people. The Israeli government sort of looked into that and decided that, of course, what they did was wrong, and there were, uh, I'll put it politely, some mistakes made, and uh, three or four people have been fired because of that. Now, I'm sure if you have friends that work for that uh, aid agency, that's not sufficient. But in its own way, the Israeli government has acknowledged, yeah, we did something wrong there. Now, right now, of course, there are no US troops involved. The US government has been sending aid. Um, the US government has also been sending some aid to the civilians in Gaza to try to 
make their lives a little bit better. Um, uh, that, uh, now, there are, as far as I can see, there are, you know, one's position on the question of whether Israel is deliberately targeting civilians depends on your overall attitude towards Israel and Gaza. Those people who are generally uh, uh, tend to be pro-Israeli say yes, it's, but it's unfortunate because Hamas embeds itself with the civilians. And so if Israel is going to go after Hamas, it's quote unquote inevitable that some civilians get killed. Um, people uh, who have a slightly different perspective on this would argue that, that uh, you know, that that may be, you know, not necessarily denying that, but that the, the civilians' casualties are completely out of control and, and Israel must be deliberately targeting civilians, not just saying, well, we're trying to hit this military target, but there are all these civilians here, so if we blow this up, it's going to have some effect out here. So, so there are different attitudes on that. There's no question that, that uh, people living in Gaza have suffered uh, uh, tremendously. Um, and uh, we, so uh, interestingly enough, you, uh, I, I'm going to talk about China and Russia, uh, but uh, they both have uh, uh, argued that what this war uh, highlights is the need for a creation of an independent Palestinian state. Um, and at least China has openly said that Israel has gone, quote, unquote, beyond self-defense. Um, uh, and now, some people argue that, you know, not saying that China is lying about their attitudes, but they are also very, very interested in having positive relationships with a number of um, uh, Arab states, and if they side with uh, the Gazans, that will increase their ability to do that. Um, uh, so again, most states have been talking about and acting to help the, the, the Palestinian civilians. One country that has, how shall I put this, gone beyond that would be Iran, uh, who is, uh, for a long time, siding with Hamas um, and um, giving them aid. Uh, uh, there has been at least a small discussion in the, in the White House about using U.S. military force if, um, uh, if Hezbollah, another group, uh, uh, joins the war in Gaza. Uh, I think that's, they, they are, Hezbollah is headquartered in Lebanon. They have a lot of rockets. They fire a lot of rockets. Um, and uh, apparently the Biden administration has communicated, uh, not publicly, but has communicated with both, Hez both Hezbollah and Iran that supports them that uh, uh, they should be sure they don't do too much because if they do too much, then the US might get more actively involved. Now, in terms of the American public, um, in terms of, you know, traditionally, of course, the U.S. government supports Israel, and as do the American people, or big chunks of the American people. If we look at uh, uh, public opinion data on that, in November of 2023, 45% uh, of the American public disapproved of uh, what Israel was doing in Gaza, and in, uh, in March, the this year, that figure went up to 55%. So uh, that's kind of where we are with that. Um, now, I'm going to talk, I will, as I mentioned, I will talk about China and Russia, but I want to talk about a few other conflicts. But let me just say, as I do to my class, at any point, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. You don't have to wait till the end, and there will be no quiz at the end either, OK? But at any point along the way, if there's something you want to say, or something you want to ask, please, please raise your hand. And there goes a hand. Yes. So you discuss um, China and Iran and their um, relationships. In 2019, Netanyahu acknowledged that he was um, not doing anything to prevent aid from Qatar and Iran to go to Hamas, saying that it was a part of their bigger plan, their plan, their concerns. Um, 
Uh, well, I'm not. He, that may very well have been correct, and he may be reacting to the uh, the tremendous losses the Israelis suffered that started this war, and has decided, you know, I've been, you know, I don't like Hamas, but I've been willing to kind of live with them if things don't get too out of control. But they've gone beyond that. So I met Yahoo are kind of sensitive that they are never able to do that again. I am not a, a specialist in any particular country or region. Uh, so uh, I am a generalist. But you know, uh, my thinking is that the start of this war led to many Nazis who considered to himself and one of his government, we've got to get rid of these people now. They've gone too far. And the prior to that, you know, with us, I guess it's just like, okay, we know you don't like us, we don't like you, but maybe we can keep the level of violence to a sort of a lowish level. But you guys, when you did that, you killed all of our people, you took all these people out, you went way above that, and now you went way above. I said, if you ask me, I think that's the purpose of this. Who's that? And, and I, th I think when this gets settled, so to speak, when the level of violence drops, I think you're going to see the Israeli government say, we need to look very closely and figure out why was it we were so badly surprised. Was it, to what extent was this an intelligence failure? That is to say, the sources of information they have didn't tell them this, you know, Versus the intelligence sources, you got it pretty correct, but it was the Israeli government decided not to act to prevent it from happening. And how do we, you know, is there some blame on both sides, et cetera, et cetera? I, I expect that Israel will take a huge look at that after, after things settle down, but I don't know when things after things are going to settle down. Yes? So why would Gaza do like a surprise attack on Israel if like if it really looks like the chances of them winning is like slim to none? Well, uh, uh, you, okay, this is just my speculation. Okay, uh, but you know, uh, I my suspicion is that uh, the people, at least in the government, uh, I'll call it the government of Hamas, um, who really, really, really don't like Israel, saw this. This festival as a wonderful opportunity to do something really bad to Israel. And as well, they, they may have thought that, that uh, Israel would be restrained by its friends and allies from an extreme response. Now, if I had been advising them, I would have told them, you know, I don't think we should count on that. But uh, if we could sort of look at what actually happened I think what we're, I'm 90% certain we're going to find that the Israelis miscalculated on what was likely to happen, okay, at least the government level did. And I suspect that Hamas, you know, are, you know, to, you know, the idea that we can show we can do bad things to Israel and to be crude about it, if we lose some of our people, that will cause a lot of people in the world to side with us. Um, but, um, I think they've miscalculated on how badly things are going to go for them. Yes? You know, I have to acknowledge that I have a, a bias and I am a big supporter of Israel. But, you know, I just wanted to say it's not a matter of they don't, that Israel doesn't like Hamas or Hamas doesn't like Israel. Hamas doesn't believe that Israel has the right. 
like to exist. And it, it's, a, it's a much stronger, in, in my opinion, of, from what I've read and studied, they have a very, they take a very, very strong position about that. Um, as far as I know, that, you know, that's, you know, at least their leadership does now, that, you know, they are also, because, it, you know, they don't control much of the area, they're really dependent on other parties helping them. So, um, you know, I think what we have seen in the past is they have been restrained by either the parties that support them telling them you can't go too far, okay, uh, um, or just Hamas is only, you know, if we go this far, then we can keep them support it. So that doesn't mean I think they're not stupid. I think they would prefer. Right, but I'm, I'm just saying it's not a matter of like or dislike. I mean, they've taken the position that, and they're very vocal about that, that they don't believe Israel has well, the right to exist. But, you know, the, what I would want to know is, okay, they say that, and certainly some of their leadership believes that. Is that what most of the people? I'm not saying you're wrong about that. In, in the same way that uh, if you look at politics in Israel, um, uh, Netanyahu represents one party from one perspective, and if he's you know, in the middle of a war, he tends to at least go through the time and hold out immunity. But prior to that, how shall I push it? He wasn't the world's most popular person. Right. right. And, and I understand that. But it is a, it is a different. Yeah, but again, you know, what you would, would like to avoid is doing things that create more enemies, both within that group and in terms of other countries. Okay? And, and I, I, you know, I think a lot of, 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 of uh, countries have been, you know, how shall I put it, um, they feel that Israel has gone too far. Because in terms of their, because they, all the civilians have been killed. Now, again, Hamas sort of integrates itself with the civilians. It doesn't say, okay, here's where Hamas is. Here's the military. This is the military part. Military part. Here's the civilian part. So Israel, it's okay to attack this group, but please stay away from here. They are like group together. Right? So, it, you know, Terms of you, you say Israel, please don't kill any more civilians than are absolutely necessary. But the question is, if Hamas is like physically indistinguishable from the civilians, how do you manage to do that? It's not a simple thing. Yes. Um, the, the short answer is I really don't know. Philosophically, I, I am less inclined to believe that there's kind of a top-down rational thing that happens in most governments. Yeah. So, um, um, so they might have encouraged a little bit, but I, but I think that, that the fundamental decision of to do this and the way to do it was probably So, uh, we'll see where this goes. Um, and, and again, I'll be, I'll be happy to take <coughs> other questions or comments about this conflict. But let me move on to a, to a, uh, a couple of other things, uh, other places in the world. Um, India and Pakistan, which right now, today, there's no active fighting going on there. Um, but um, th these are two countries that, how shall I say, have not gotten along very well historically. Um, and uh, 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 they, they really don't want to sit down and talk to each other. 
Uh, if you're counting, they fought wars against one another in 1947, 1965, 1971, and 1999. And they have had a number of armed conflicts below the level of war. Okay? Um, and uh, why is this? of interest to the United States? Well, one reason is there's this country called China that's quite close, and so maybe China gets involved, and we're really about China, I'll talk about that later. Another reason why we sort of have a degree of concern about what's happening between India and Pakistan is again, they have a long history of, of fighting each other, and they both have nuclear weapons. And, we, you know, so it's like, if we, is some kind of danger, at least in principle, that if they were to fight extensively, and let's say one side, one of the countries feels we're, we're taking too many losses, we're losing too much, they might choose to escalate to the next level, and that would be a really bad thing. Um, okay, um, let me talk about one that you're uh, probably less familiar with, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, they have had conflict in the past. Uh, they are no peace treaty. Um, uh, and uh, in addition, Armenia has this ally called Russia, who seems to be doing a bunch of bad things throughout the world. Um, and uh, uh, now, uh, and so all else being equal, the U.S. tends to favor Azerbaijan over Armenia. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, the, the, um, it, it certainly right now, the U.S. would not be supportive of military action from Azerbaijan uh, against Armenia um, in, in, in great measure because right now, one of our arguments for supporting Ukraine is that you know, Russia is trying to take over areas that are clearly part of Ukraine. There, there's a border here, you know, and Russia doesn't belong over that border. So how do we argue that about Russia and Ukraine if we don't also support that between Azerbaijan and Armenia, okay? So uh, at some point in the future, we might expect to, expect to see uh, a more significant an armed conflict between these two, and although the U.S. sides with one of the countries over the other, it, we're in kind of an awkward position about that. Uh, okay, uh, another country, Iran. Okay, um, and um, uh, right now, uh, Iran does not have nuclear weapons, but they are, uh, have the, I'll say, the raw capability to develop nuclear weapons. In addition, they support a number of groups throughout the world who uh, the U.S. is opposed to, and some of these groups fight against literally countries that we do support. So, you know, we worry about Iran as a country that might develop nuclear weapons. Uh, but we also worry about Iran as a country that supports a wide variety of groups who are committing or are capable of committing violent acts against our friends. So they're kind of in the background there. Now, there was um, actually uh, a treaty that Iran signed that um, uh, uh, was designed, and I think it was designed pretty well to make it very, very hard for Iran to get nuclear weapons, okay? And um, in 2018, uh, the U.S. withdrew from that agreement. Now, um, uh, I think, you know, and some people said that was the right thing to do, some people said that was the wrong thing to do. In, in my mind, in terms of, you know, how should you decide that, I think what you need to do is ask yourself the question, how big an issue for you is Iran getting nuclear weapons? Okay? Uh, there are a lot of other things Iran does that we don't like and we shouldn't <coughs> like, but is getting nuclear weapons such a big issue, you know, that you are, if that's the case, 
and you should be willing, you should have been willing to support that treaty even though that's the only issue it covered, okay? If you think, well, that's one issue, and of course it's not a small issue, but there's so many other things that Iran does, and that treaty didn't talk about any of those things, and in return for Iran promising they wouldn't do nuclear weapons and inspections, uh, we would do nice things for them. Well, that's too many nice things for a country that is uh, uh, out there supporting all sorts of bad groups. Um, uh, and in addition, um, most people believe that uh, uh, Iran is also uh, doing research and development on chemical and biological weapons. I haven't seen anything because I don't have a security clearance. And even if I did, I couldn't tell you what I would see, but I haven't seen anything out there in the open that says they are incredibly close to having those kinds of weapons. But the sort of the foundations of programs for chemical and biological weapons kind of come to countries as they develop economically. So I don't think there's any question that Iran could develop those weapons in a reasonable period of time if they wanted to. Um, and, um, but again, right now, the big issues are they're supporting groups like Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, uh, and, and which the US government uh, <coughs> believes is a global terrorist threat. Uh, they are also supporting the Houthi uh, rebels in Yemen. And uh, since you're sitting in here and don't have to be here, I assume you know, no one you know, is forcing you to be here. You probably do pay attention to what's happening in the world, at least a little bit. And so you probably are aware uh, that these people have been uh, uh, attacking oil shipping in the Red Sea. Okay, they are capable of doing that. And that's kind of a, uh, a, a, a big deal. Uh, because something like uh, at least 12% of all the oil that's shipped around the world goes through the Red Sea. Now, if there are attacks, then it's like, all right, then we won't go through the Red Sea. But obviously, getting oil in, uh, in tankers to places takes a lot longer that way. So these, again, this is a group the U.S. government is very much opposed to. Uh, this is but this is a group that Iran supports. So at least for now, our main concern with Iran is they support groups who are doing things we don't like versus a direct confrontation with Iran. Um, but but they potentially could develop nuclear weapons. Oh, speaking of countries with nuclear weapons, let's talk a little bit about North Korea. Um, North Korea, first of all, uh, is actively pursuing uh, uh, better relations with both China and Russia, uh, whether it's financial support, uh, defense cooperation. They are obviously a, a major threat to South Korea, a long-term long ally of the United States. Uh, their first nuclear test was in October of 2006. Uh, if you look around in the public information, uh, the uh, consensus is right now they have about 30 nuclear warheads, but they have the raw material uh, that would allow them to very quickly add another 50 to 70 warheads. Um, uh, and uh, they have various missiles and things like that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so they are uh, a legitimate nuclear power. Uh, and uh, they also are believed to be developing biological weapons. Their army has 1.1 million people in it. To give you a little perspective on that, the South Korean army has 420,000 people in it. Uh, the US army has about 465,000 in it. Um, and uh, uh, in addition, uh, and this is in some ways kind of sad, but uh, North Korea has been helping Russia uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, uh, helping replace some of the military losses that Russia has suffered in Ukraine. I think it's kind of like, really? You have this big country called Russia, and they need help from this very poor country, North Korea, in terms of their military. Uh, uh, but uh, 
Um, again, they in uh, North Korea, uh, is clearly a country we need to worry about, primarily locally in the region there. Would they be interested in uh, going after South Korea again? Would they be interested in developing more weapons of mass destruction and at a minimum trying to terrorize their neighbors, uh, things like that. So uh, that's a country we have to keep an eye on. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm going to spend um, uh, basically the rest of my lecture on uh, Russia and China, and let me give you a couple of figures here comparing them to the United States. Uh, you, you know, you can see, well, uh, I'll just let you read the figures here. Uh, but you can see uh, when we look, for example, uh, First, first of all, GDP per capita is kind of a standard measure of like how well off are the people in a country, okay? And it looks to me like if you had your choice of living in one of those three countries, that your first choice would be the United States. Uh, Russia and China are way behind. Um, in terms of the defense budgets, uh, the U.S. is way ahead now, uh, you know, if you worry, uh, uh, let me talk about China. If you worry about China, that's the good news. The bad news is, though, that at least at this point in time, China's primary concern in terms of its military and things like that is in Asia, okay? Whereas the U.S. military has to be concerned about things all over the world, okay? So it's like, you know, the good news is our Navy, for example, is much bigger than China's. The bad news is a lot of our Navy can't be in the Western Pacific because it's doing other things in other places. Uh, as you can see with nuclear weapons, uh, for, if you want to impress your friends, uh, SNDVs use strategic nuclear delivery vehicles which means uh, basically missiles, and there are kind of two general varieties of those. There are ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, that are launched from land, uh, and they are either mobile on some kind of vehicle or in a silo that's built to withstand a big amount of blast. Um, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles, which is pretty much what it says. That is, these are uh, long-range missiles with nuclear warheads deployed on submarines. And then, of course, bombers. Um, uh, and when we say strategic nuclear delivery vehicles, we're talking about uh, missile silos on land, uh, uh, missiles on submarines, and a number of bombers. And you can see that the US has a decent lead over Russia and a uh, even bigger lead over uh, China. Now, um, that's the good news about that. Um, uh, but and when I talk about Russia, I'll, I'll give you the bad news, so just, just be ready for it. Um, now, um, uh, if we look at China's defense spending, it has doubled in the past decade. But if we, if we see, what we see is it's basically the same proportion of its GDP to its economy every year. So, and so its economy keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So therefore, its defense budget gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and, and so the fact that it's a lot bigger now than it used to be doesn't necessarily mean China's thinking, ah, we need a really big military and we want to do stuff with it against the United States. It may be just, well, we need a reasonable military and now that our economy is so much bigger, we can afford, uh, we can afford a, a bigger military. Um, now, the... I, I, you know, China tries to influence countries throughout the world uh, to favor them, and in a number of cases, not all the time, but in a number of cases, that means they're, they're not favoring us. Uh, but I think the, the biggest issue to be concerned about is that China has always said that Taiwan is part of China, and it should be reunited. And it turns out that most people in Taiwan don't see it that way. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have to say, you know, if that, if China really, really, really decides that needs to happen, the only way that would happen would be 
that they invaded Taiwan to conquer it. So, you know, how ready is Taiwan for that? How much help should we be able to give them? How would that end up? So uh, uh, that's something that, that we have to be concerned with. Um, uh, now, um, let me uh, give you a couple other things about China. Uh, GDP gross domestic product uh, is kind of a standard way if you want to sort of figure out how powerful a country is and express it in numbers. Um, and you can see that, that there will come a time, not that far in the future, uh, where uh, China's GDP is expected to be larger than ours. Okay? And uh, there's not very much we can do about that. Um, and uh, some people argue, again, you know, it's not like they look at this graph and go, okay, exactly right here is when we get to be bigger than the U.S., so that's when we're going to get really obnoxious with the U.S., that it's not kind of that, you know, that closely related. But as they become more powerful, uh, a number of people expect them to be, how shall I put it, a little more active uh, against the United States. Uh, so, there, so that's uh, potentially a problem. Now, um, all of that is kind of at least potentially bad news from the United States. Let me give you some good news. Um, if we look at G GDP per capita, what we see is uh, China is much lower than the U.S., and in fact, the gap is getting bigger and bigger. So uh, the average uh, person in China it's none of my business how well any of you are doing, other than just really excited about this great lecture. But, but, uh, but you know, traditionally we kind of say, well, if your GDP per capita, the bigger that is, kind of the more well off and the happier most people are. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, if, you know, and if China, the government of China says, we want to do X, Y, and Z, I see your hand, and I'll get to you in just one second, okay? Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, but for the average Chinese, they may say, well, our government says this and that, and we're big and we're powerful, but I look around, and me and my family and my friends, we're not doing that well. So I'm not so sure our, we should be worried about or trying to think about doing stuff with that big, bad USA. Why don't we do more so that my life and my family's life is better, which means more effort internally. You had a question or a comment? Uh, maybe you can answer this. So you can see how, how the other graph you showed in this graph of China and Russia like showed that a while ago compared to the US. So you know the failure in the Cold War, how the US is like kind of shut down itself industrially. How come, do you know why they haven't switched? Like it's, it's pretty obvious that communism can't work just because the numbers don't lie. So do you know why they haven't? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that the leadership, you know, believes that. At least, like, you know, uh, right now, with the kind of government we have, I am the leader of China, and, and I like that, and that allows me to do things that I think are good for China. If we let the people have more of a say, we won't be doing the things we need to do, okay? And, and so this is not about, let me uh, talk about the U.S. just for a second. Uh, there's a, a question that gets asked on national surveys maybe five or six times a year. Uh, and it's, there's a little bit of a preamble, but the bottom line is, what's the most important problem that, uh, facing the United States? And they give you a lot of categories, right? Um, if you look at the, the answers to that, and you put together the people that pick anything that's close, that's related at all to foreign policy or international affairs, and you sum up all that, it's virtually always less than 20%. Okay? So what you know, one way to think about that is you know, the American public wants its government to concentrate on what's happening domestically. That's where it sees, the public sees the problems. That's what it wants fixed. So uh, if the US says, you know, we've got this problem, you know, 
uh, between Gaza and Israel, and we'd like to see the conflict end there. We're also worried, you know, that Russia is doing all this stuff in Ukraine. There is increasing resistance among some politicians and a lot of Americans to continuing to aid Ukraine. Okay, and you know, in terms of the public, one can say, look, here's what's going on. For most Americans, what happens there? either doesn't affect them or they don't believe it affects them. They're worried about things like the prices of uh, food just went up, the prices of education just went up, um, all sorts of other things. That's what we want our government to concentrate on. That's what we want our government to spend its money on, okay? So, um, uh, and again, you know, some people think you're, you're going to, there's, you know, the Chinese people may like be saying, things aren't going that well for me. But that's one thing, and you know, we can say in the United States if that's how you feel. Well, there's an election coming up in November, right? And why don't you vote for a candidate that who's closer to you in terms of what the priorities should be? Now, you might say, I've read stuff on all the candidates and no one is close to but at least in the United States, there is the possibility of changing the government. Um, but for China, uh, it's like we don't have a system that allows us to do that in terms of elections or something like that. So how do we make that change? You know, do we go out on the streets and yell and scream and blow stuff up? So uh, the, you know, the other thing is I don't know how you know unhappy most Chinese are about things. So we may look and say, well, look at that gap there. You know, your government, you know, you, you get bigger and bigger and bigger, but you all, ordinary Chinese citizens, don't benefit from that. Okay? But uh, they may feel, you know, it is going up. It's not going up a lot, but they may feel, hey, you know, this this is working but they don't have a way to change the system within the, the rules of the system. So, you know, therefore, what should they do about it? You know, the options are not so great. Let me get back here and now. Yes? Yeah, um, you have any comments? The Chinese GDP um, is very low, and as we know, they don't pay their workers a lot of money. A lot of U.S. companies, and most U.S. companies, So, and, and, and you, know, you know, from a company's point of view, I don't work for a company, so I don't know, but you know, it's like, well, you know, do you want the stuff you buy from us to be more expensive? Because when you tell us don't buy from China, stuff from China, where we would have to buy it would be more expensive. So are you willing to pay the highest price? And I'm, not, I'm not saying you, 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 you know, you would be against that, but that, you know, and, Traditionally, we want to keep our government out of company decisions as much as possible. Okay? So the question is, is I look around the room here, do enough of you feel that this is a significant enough problem that our government, our right legislation to prevent companies from doing that? Or at least impose a heavy cost on them. If you really, for example, you say, well, you can buy the cell phone, we're going to tax you so heavily that you're going to have to raise your prices and people will buy less as well. Okay. So um, we could do that, but you know, uh, you know, we would have to believe the American public would, would put up with that. I, I just don't know if that would be the case. But that would be the basic argument against it. We don't want our government telling companies what to do any more than it's necessary. But you're right, that means in some cases, not because companies are supporting these policies in other countries, but just because it's cheaper for them to get stuff. Right, but they do lobby against you know, investigations and the like when it comes to unethical uh, labor, especially outsourcing to other countries. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't take a closer look at it. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, if we did and we found that that stuff was going on, all of you come back and ask me to raise your hand. Would you all be willing to pay more for stuff? Because that would be if we forbade our companies from doing business with us. We've done, you know, we've certainly done that in uh, the various problems in the national time. So this is not like it's a completely new thing. But the consequence is we, you and I pay more for stuff. Do people feel this is important? No, they should. They'd be willing to pay more for food or for computers or whatever it might be. Okay? And I'm not saying the public wouldn't. I'm just saying that's probably something that we need to take a look at to see would that policy actually be successful? Or would, it, would, it, would a lot of people say, well, uh, the U.S. version of this is now much more expensive. I'm just going to go buy from China for that version. And then you say, well, guess what? We'll put Wall Street up to make it substantially bad, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, does that uh, cause enough problems with enough Americans that that's enough? People will vote for other people and we'll go for our vote back. So we probably have to take a look at that. And that's certainly something we should be doing because we don't like what these countries do that allows them to be cheaper lets them do things that we don't think are just. And the question, you had a question. Yeah, uh, you mentioned about the American, uh, I guess, uh, sentiment of Americans to regard the Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. And, but uh, I think we should need to learn from history because before the Second World War, uh, Americans didn't feel like Hitler, you know, that America was whatever Hitler was doing on the, on the all the atrocities and all the, the, the aggression, you know, they, they also felt kind of very cautious. And you, so Great Britain was fighting a, pretty much by itself for yeah. quite a number of times. So yeah. I think we should learn from history. Well, uh, it, it, so yes, it, it, we can say, look, Americans, when you look at what you say are the big problems you're concerned with, you're underestimating the negative effect of some of these things overseas. But we would have to do, uh, the, 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 the thing that most Americans look at domestic issues and problems versus foreign policy problems, it's, it's been happening for, forever, okay? And you might be able to remind them about, remember that Hitler dude? That caused a little bit of a problem. Um, but, but, you know, I don't know how many Americans would be persuaded by that, okay? Now, so there are things a government may be able to do, but at a minimum, I think we have to recognize, the government has to recognize that for most Americans, most of the time, it's domestic things that they're worried about. And it, it, that's not, crazy because for most Americans it's the domestic stuff that has the biggest impact on them. You know, if you're a tiny poor country, you're totally dependent on other countries helping you. So if you have bad relations with them, everybody suffers. But that's not the case with us. So making convincing people that these other things uh, are important, uh, you you need to make a major effort. Again, historically, most of the time, most Americans are primarily concerned with domestic issues. Okay. Um, now, um, let me um, let me uh, give you a little more bad news about China. Um, first of all, uh, if I if you've ever heard of this, raise your hand. This is not a quiz. You're not going to get great on. Uh, does anybody know what? And it's kind of like much what it says, what the one child policy was in China. Anybody heard of that? Okay. So uh, China uh, was worried about having uh, an excess of population, okay? And like the more people you have, particularly uh, young people, it's like, uh, excuse me, audience, if young people are kind of cost more than they produce, so to speak, okay? Um, and so in, in the China's concern with overpopulation led them to implement something called the One Child Policy in 1980, uh, which was ended in 2016. And again, the idea is, you know, if you, a married couple, you're only supposed to have one child, okay? And 
that, you know, if everybody does that, that will slow down the population growth. And, uh, well, uh, the good news is uh, that that was reasonably successful. Um, but, um, uh, and, and then China said, okay, overpopulation seems to be less of a problem. We'll ease up on that. But it turns out that uh, most young Chinese couples are now choosing only to have one child. They're not being forced by the government, but they're choosing. So, you know, it's like, all right, well, what's the problem there? Well, let's look uh, at the proportion of a population of over 65 uh, from uh, every 10 years in the U.S. and China uh, out to 2050. Now, let me say that I would be one of those people over 65, just so <laughs> clear about that. Um, and what you see is that things pretty much stay the way they are. Uh, by 2050, 22% of the American public will be over 65. Now, why is that a bad thing, uh, according to some people? We don't typically think that people over 65 contribute a lot. We think they take a lot, you know, uh, like I'm gonna be retiring at the end of the semester at Rice, so I won't be teaching or doing research anymore, but I have social security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, uh, but what you see is uh, uh, the legacy, if you will, or one of the legacies of the one child policy is by 2050, a little over a third of the population of China will over 65, right? So China is growing, China is developing, but, and even, you know, you could say, well, the, the government of China could say, okay, all right, but we're just, we're not gonna give the retired people enough to sort of let them live in luxury, okay? You know, and it's like, okay, fine, but you're still gonna have over a third of your population that we normally assume is not contributing to the country, but taking resources away, okay? And there's nothing they can, they can't write a piece of legislation and change that, okay? So uh, China is a growing power. Uh, we worry uh, to some extent about as they get more powerful, how will they act in the world? And how will their interests and our interests maybe collide with one another? But, uh, but China is going to have some significant internal issues that uh, even if they choose not to deal with them extensively, are going to hold them back, okay? Um, now, Russia. Uh, first of all, I mentioned nuclear weapons. I, I teach um, sort of a sophomore, junior level class at Rice. That's the official title is the uh, Politics of American National Security. Oh, I'm sorry, but did you all fall asleep with that? <laughs> uh, it is known informally on campus as bombs and rockets. Uh, and one of the uh, exercises I always give to the students, uh, uh, because I think they learned a lot from doing it, and the numbers change the, uh, a bit from year to year. So if you hand in your roommate's assignment from two years ago, it's kind of uh, but it's like, what would happen if there was a Russian first strike against American missile silo? Uh, you know, what would, how much stuff would Russia use? How much stuff would they destroy? What would be left over? And vice versa. Um, and um, uh, I can tell you uh, that uh, I'm not sure if this is the good news or the bad news, that um, no matter how successful um, uh, a, U, uh, a U.S. strike would be. Russia would have enough stuff, technical term, left over to kill over half the population of the United States. Okay, so um, uh, you know uh, we can you look at the uh, sort of the nuts and bolts of the nuclear balance, but Russia has a, a very large number of nuclear weapons. They're all, you know, if you look at quality, they're probably not as good as ours, but there's really nothing that we could do to, you know, 
get their stockpile down low enough so that uh, any Russian nuclear strike wouldn't do much damage to the United States. Now, I should also tell you that, so I have them do this exercise, and they figure out what's left in terms of nuclear weapons. Um, and then I uh, use some uh, PowerPoint figures and show them what would happen if there was a one megaton blast that went off on the middle of the Rice campus, okay? Uh, and uh, I do that because uh, you can look up, uh, maybe some of you are looking up right now on your phones, like what would happen if there was a, a nuclear, a major nuclear explosion in New York City or Washington or Moscow, those are three cities you could do. But, you know, my problem as a teacher is unless, have any of you lived in the, any of those cities? Okay. If you haven't lived there, then the distances just don't register for you that well. If I do it for Houston, it's, a, but basically, uh, let's assume that, uh, that Putin is not gonna center a nuclear weapon on the Rice campus. Uh, but basically a one megaton uh, Russian uh, nuclear explosion uh, would kill everyone inside the loop, okay? And even in the best of circumstances, uh, an American first flight would leave the Russians with hundreds of megatons, okay? So, um, uh, you know, uh, nuclear weapons are pretty bad things. And, and yes, Russia's arsenal is not as big and not as good as ours, but they could still do an immense amount of, uh, of damage. Um, in terms of the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, Russia has made some advances. They have had uh, uh, a lot of, they've lost a lot of people. It has created a, a, a significant amount of havoc with uh, their economy. Uh, it has not made them uh, friends throughout the world. Um, right now, Russia is trying to sort of increase its ties with China, uh, with Iran, and with North Korea but they're kind of about the only friends they have left. Um, I suspect that this Putin dude, uh, what he's thinking about is that, okay, things have not gone as well as I thought in Ukraine, but the American public's gonna get tired of it, okay? And if there was a, if a drop, a significant drop in American support for that would cause serious problems. Okay? There are other countries that are sending money or sending equipment, uh, mainly equipment and things like that to Ukraine, and they would be, they might well continue to do that. But without the U.S., it doesn't look that great for Ukraine. So um, uh, I, I suspect, you know, because I don't think Putin is the kind of person who wants to admit, hey, everybody, I'm sorry I screwed up. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, and so, but I think it's my, I want to keep after this, I want to keep after this, and if, and if someone says, well, but why do you think things are going to change? Uh, and, and I think his answer is, the U.S. is, 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 is at some point in the future going to decide it's no longer worth it to help Ukraine. And once that happens, then we can really make some progress. Uh, I think that, by the way, there's no question that Russia did try to interfere in the last election. And everyone believes that they, it's something they will be doing again in this election, okay? Uh, uh, now, I think there's one issue with like, how much of an effect ha did they have? Um, 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 most people, and I'm not looking at anyone in particular in this room, you know, when you consume news and information about say, or, you know, what's happening in the election, who's ahead, et cetera, et cetera. Um, most people have a tendency to consume information. That, well, I want, I want it from a trusted source, okay? Now, for, for, for a number of people, that means someone, some source that agrees with me, okay? Because I'm right. So a, a trusted source, a source that's got it right, must be someone who agrees with me. So, so you can, it's, it's pretty clear 
that a lot of people uh, consume <coughs> this Russian quote unquote information they were feeding us. But in a lot of cases, as far as we can tell, it's people that already believe what Russia was saying. So it probably didn't change that many minds, okay? But I think we can assume they will try that again. Um, uh, again, they, they, but they are having significant troubles uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and as long as there's enough aid for Ukraine, I don't see a dramatic change coming on the battlefield. Now, maybe Russia is willing to keep fighting for years and years and years. Uh, or one can imagine a, uh, uh, an end to the war uh, where, uh, 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 you know, it's like, okay, we, Russia, get to keep the parts we occupied already. Okay? Uh, I don't think that will happen, but I, one could at least imagine that's a possibility. So um, um, I expect over the next five to 10 years that we, you know, there, there are all these little flashpoints I mentioned, but the biggest concerns are, of course, Russia and China, which you probably knew before you got here, okay? Um, uh, so I think it's going to be an interesting role, but we have a number of advantages. Uh, and if we have decent policy, we ought to be able to keep ahead of things. We have the opportunity I think to have influence other countries to side with us uh, and help us. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think things are necessarily that bad, but those are the countries that we have to pay more attention to. Yes. Um, you did mention all Chinese Americans being here and having received things on social media, but the U.S. with whistleblowing involving the U.S. and China being interfering in health and damage outside of the country is sometimes still. Um, I mean, I think there are all sorts of groups, you know, they would like to see a particular outcome in the election. What I say about that, it's not like everybody wants the same outcome. They're going to be trying to convince enough Americans to vote for a candidate that they want. Um, how do I put this? Most Americans do not pay that much attention to what's going on in our country. You folks are weird because you're here tonight, okay? Um, um, you know, and, and the issues that, that tend to drive most American voters are domestic issues. And, and most of it comes down to how am I doing? Am I better off now than I was two years ago? And if I am, then maybe I'll vote for this Biden group because he was president, so I guess he deserves some of the credit. And if I feel, you know, I'm not as well off, I'll vote for this. I think that uh, to the extent that we are concerned about China and Russia, that countries that 
maybe their overall policies, maybe their form of government is not our ideal, but if those countries are concerned about Russian and Chinese influence, I think we ought to be working with them at least to some extent. Okay. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, it, there's a uh, uh, sort of a, there's a, a theory The international relations called power politics, okay, or, or realism. And the kind of realism says it's, what happens is not about the kind of government you have, but how powerful you are and what you do with that. Okay? I think the US ought to be reaching out to countries, even if we disagree with them politically, at least to a certain extent. Uh, because maybe, uh, number one, that puts more people on the side with us and against Russia and China. But number two, if they work with us, maybe they say, hey, you know, they seem to be better in the US than over here. Maybe we should be more like them. I mean, I don't think that's like, you know, like a 30 second ad every two weeks on television and you can hear someone. But it's if, if you get to work with people from the US and you see they are doing really I don't think uh, we should turn away countries that you know, seem to be willing to work with us, except in the most extreme cases. Yes, sir. I found that the largest funder for international issues has been the United States. However, even though we are a big portion of the peace of the world, what about the other countries? Such as um, the UK, if you put billions, you know, I think it's something like 60 billion to Ukraine, that's nothing compared to any of the other countries that have helped any other international issue at the moment. What are they doing that they're helping? Uh, a number of countries are doing something. Now, number one, you know, we're bigger than, uh, than, than Great Britain, you know. But the number two, it's also, I think, if you want them to do more, which I think is, yeah, sure. But we have to show leadership. If we're not willing to do a lot, why should they? Because number one, it's like, you know, you're not using a lot of your resources. Why do you want us to make life more difficult for our people? Because it's taking away money from them. You know. and, and you're so much bigger than us anyway. Um, so even if we gave a lot in our own terms, it's not big as your size. So, yeah, I think we have to lead by example if we want other countries to follow along. And I think there is some advantage to having a lot of countries follow along, even if the total number of artillery shells doesn't quadruple. Because I think it sends a message to Russia that, you know, most countries don't like what you're doing here. So the number of friends you can have and work with uh, is going to be is going to diminish greatly if you keep this up. Although I've also noticed during the Korean War, mm -hmm. the U.S. made money to play most of the most of the issues there too. How long will we have to continue playing this, you know, big brother before someone else steps in? I I don't know. Uh, and part of that is you know how long is Russia and Putin willing to continue? a war that appears, at least right now, to be kind of a stalemate in the sense that neither side, at least recently, has been able to make a lot of gains. Right? Yes. I'm all for helping other people, but what about our own issues? You know, because the prices of living have dramatically increased in most of these, and yet we're still spending more than what most people can see in their life, if not hundreds of their lifetime, to a random country that sends no support back at all. You know, like what if they pay it to Ukraine for us? Then that would make me a little Well, in terms of Ukraine, they, they, they don't, you know, they, they would pay for other countries to pay for our support to go home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think Americans have every right to say, you know, our, you, how much of your effort, U.S. government, should go to helping us versus doing things abroad? And I think it's up to government, uh, the leadership, to convince you that it's 
what if it, if your life doesn't become a lot better over the next few years? It's it, it's worth it because we were able to stop Russia and Ukraine. Okay. Now, can they do that? And I'm not thinking about you in particular, right? But can, but again, most Americans, most of the time, it's domestic issues that are the only concern. Now, uh, you know, you can argue, but in some cases, it's like, okay, all right. Uh, uh, you don't like the fact that Senator Walker or Hillary would go. What if you work for a company that makes our children go? Okay? So you, as a worker now, you're actually benefiting from that. And maybe there are enough views to, uh, to vote in that state to keep the current administration in power. Okay? Uh, and, and, and the idea is there's, uh, you know, anybody have some basic so it's like if you're doing well working in our utility factory, that means you've got more money, which means you're spending more money, which means the, the grocery store down the street is making more money than you. So uh, part of this involves uh, the government explaining that this this is not simply quote unquote giving away stuff to Ukraine. It's if a number of Americans directly and indirectly can be helped. Now, I'm not suggesting it makes up for the fact that all of this stuff goes on in America, but there are some benefits to Americans because we're doing that. Although, as, as someone who is in big money, like myself, the issue is, is that we are all taxed in salient amounts, and we are forced to give the same amounts, which is fine, but we would at least like to see some changes within our own government and in our own you know, lifestyles. I don't want to see grocery prices go you know, three or four times Giving thirty million dollars to the government. Okay. Well, be sure to vote in the election for the candidates that you think support the former leader. Sure. Whatever. And again, I'm not saying who those people are. That's what the comment said. Yeah. Well, what I want to say about the Ukraine Russia war is, so so President Biden is like every like, oh yeah yeah, let's support Russia. No, 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 Ukraine, Ukraine, Russia. Yeah, let's support Ukraine. Like let's help them out, which I understand. But yeah, I don't understand the hypocrisy behind it because they literally bought oil from Russia. Would that literally just be giving money to the enemy? I don't understand that. Well, you know, first of all, most economic interchange occurs between neighbors or countries that are close together. Okay. So, uh, uh, but um, you know, I think the U.S. government should say. Life is a little complicated, okay? And we don't, for example, I don't think we want to cut off all relations with Russia because of what's happening here. I think we want to be able to keep talking to them, for example. Um, um, and, and you know, it, you know, there are some mutual things that go back and forth where we both benefit. But it's also, you know, even you know, let's suppose things don't work between the US and Russia, not being able to So, you know, life is, there There are very few situations where someone is like a 100% total enemy. There's nothing you guys have in common. Okay. So, uh, I think we should continue to support Ukraine, but we should continue, for example, I think uh, uh, we, uh, we ought to talk to the Russians more about giving them nuclear weapons, for example. I think that would benefit us. But it doesn't normally say we're either all with you or all against you. Life is a little more complicated than that. Uh, well, even in the Cold War, because it was like, you know, we don't like each other, we, we compete against each other, but, you know, each other blowing everybody up, that's probably not a good thing. So we probably don't want to go that far. Even, okay. even during the Cold War, Russia and the U.S. did not directly have a war with that's right, and, and we, in fact, we, we did some things to kind of minimize the change. Yeah, I mean, yeah it, it's already been 7.15, so we a little bit over the time. So if you would like to talk to uh, I'll stick around for a little Dr. Stoll, please. Yeah.